And this is where we made our tape that I sent to Atron that got Pacus deal. Leila Steinberg called me and asked me if I was interested in meeting Tupac. And at the time, I was working with a group called Digital Underground. And I called Shock G, who's the leader of the group, and asked him if he wanted to meet Tupac. And he said he would. And he was in the studio, just sent him down. Atron and Layla sent this kid Pac to the studio. We were mixing down Sex Packets, our first album. Pac came in the studio strictly business. Maintain eye contact with me the whole time. I'm at the mixing board. Do you want me to rhyme now? What's up, Shock G? Shock G? What's up? I'm Tupac. Uh, you want to hear it right now? <laughs> I was like, damn, this cat's intense, you know? It's like, yo, run this back and put some reverb on that track. I'm going to go in the booth with this cat. Let's go in the piano room. And he busted. It was street. It was educated. It was articulate. We came out the booth. I was like, yeah, you tight. I'm, I'm going to holler at H and I'm going to tell him. He was like, all right. In 1990, you weren't really blown away by Pac's rhymes. His rhymes were better than average. I remember one song was the case of the misplaced mic. Got home from school, my mic was missing. Got on the phone, called Dizzy. I can't find my mic, word, let's get busy. The case of the misplaced mic. The case of the misplaced, it's like hip hop fantasy type stuff, you know, spy looking for his mic. It was either that or political wasn't thugged out yet. Layla brought Pac over from Marin to meet Digital. And right away, him and my son hit it off. You know, Pac decided that he wanted to be in the group. Pac had told Layla or Atron that, you know, if he doesn't do something now, you know, he's going to go to Atlanta and be in the New African Panthers or something like that. And Atron was like, well, if Pac doesn't do something now, he's going to break out. He's like, why don't you let Pac roll? Because, you know, I want to sign him. You know, and I think he has talent. And I was like, yeah, he's, he is kind of hot. And that's why he wound up Brody and dancing background rapping. He came out. Once he came on the road, every chance he get, you know, he get on the mic. You know, after the shows, after parties, he grabbed the mic and just, you know, once people saw him, it was history. And as we got to know him, we started working him into the rhyming situations more and more as most we could, you know. We were on our second album at the time, EP release, and Dan Aykroyd wanted us to do this movie with him, Nothing But Trouble, and do the soundtrack. And Pac was on tour with us when we got offered, and that's, that's why Pac wound up on the same song. I remember once when he thought the sound man was messing up the show. Pac took it personal and ran up on the sound man and said, yo! He tried to beat up the sound man. Fuck the sound up! He went to swing on him and our manager grabbed him. He didn't realize the sound man's friend was getting ready to hit him with something, so I had to grab him. We were like, yo, Pac, you know, you can't beat up the sound man. He hit that sound man when he didn't understand it. That wasn't just our sound man. That was the sound man for the whole G Street tour. But he's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> you know how many times I fired Pac? <laughs> Fuck that. I wasn't, you weren't supposed to sing right there. He's the singer. You're a rapper. You don't want him singing over your part. Right? Fuck that. I knew you was going to say that. We were losing the crowd right there. We had to do something. He wasn't singing that shit right. You wouldn't know. You're not a singer. Fuck that. You sending me home? Yeah, I'm sending you home. Fuck that. Pac's off the tour. It would be living like that. Almost fighting. Two hours later, knock, knock. Yo, what's up? Let's go get some hoes. <laughs> you know? You know, we just had a lot of fun back then. You know, we spent a lot of time in the, in the bus talking, spent a lot of time running around, just having a good time. It was a, it was a good period because there wasn't, at that time, there was minimal pressure on Tupac. Tupac's first big break came with Same Song, which he recorded with Digital Underground. There was a day we were coming from the city. We were going back to Santa Rosa, and all of a sudden, the same song came on KMBL, and that was a song that Pac did with Digital. And we were so excited to hear it. And I'm asking everyone, get your money out. I need $2 to get over the bridge. I didn't have any money. And everyone searched their pockets, and no one had any money. And I ended up having to write a check to get over the bridge. And the one thing that was funny is that Pac said we should all remember it would be the last time he couldn't pay $2 to get over a bridge. So it was a real big event. It was a big event in the streets and the hoods out here because nobody from this area ever made it. 
in the black community like that. And, you know, hell yeah, it was a major celebration. My name is Shock G. And I'm too motherfucking Pac. Yeah, OK. My man Humpty Hump and the whole Digital Underground Posse finna come out with yet another album, even more slamming than the last. We just finna go straight underground. We finna live up to the name, Digital Underground. Tupacalypse come out with a new album, Troublesome. We finna just hit y'all like a family. We all just, you know, trying to make it. We were like family to him. You know, we got him his first apartment. He had no credit. He couldn't drive. He had no driver's license. So we used to have to work the applications and we would all pitch in and borrow a credit card and co-sign, and we did all the shit we had to do. To get closer to the game, Tupac moved across the bay to Oakland. Coming out of New York, I always learned about flavor and different shit like that. Not to diss New York, I learned a lot, but I never knew the game. I never learned the game. And when I went to Baltimore, I didn't learn the game. Nobody ever took the time to show me the game. When I got to Oakland, that's when I learned the game. And this is the land of the hustle. And you also will find that in Oakland, a lot of people do not back down from things. You know, that whole Oakland Raider, blue collar uh, mentality is a very much a, an identity for a lot of people in the city. His first solo album, Tupacalypse Now, was explosive and propelled him into the spotlight. And with this came new dangers. I come to his house and all the lights would be on. He's on the first floor apartment, drapes wide open. Occasionally a window open with just a screen. I came over and I was like, Pac, for real, man, you're not getting a message. You can't leave your windows wide open with all these gold records and, and all your jewelry laying out on the counters and stuff. He was like, oh, I ain't worried about that. I ain't show you? Oh, went in the closet, his first AK ever bought. He came out, because if someone come up in here, I wait. You saw that? <laughs> Shot the floor and the sofa all up. Damn near killed uh, a couple of the outlaws. They were little kids just sitting on the couch getting high. Woo, you saw that? Like, this is, it's got some shit to it. Beautiful. When I first met him, I, I said, hey, this, this guy here, he, he's going to be big. You know, I knew it instantly. It was just the power that was coming from him, you know, his voice. I remember looking at the Billboard charts one day on the tour bus. We were looking at Pac's first album. We were like, oh, you doing, you doing good, Pac. You know, he was like in the 40s or 50s somewhere with his first album. Sons of the P was in the top 10 and had just got certified and all that. And I remember Pac storming out the room looking at the chart how his album went. And he just looked at me and went, if I could get a beat, like, kiss you back. Walk away. <laughs> I'm like, whoa. Because usually I let him pick the tracks. He's like, yeah, I want this one, I want this one. But then I realized he wanted me to get involved and, and tell him, this is the star track. He was telling me, like, he can't pick them, just give me something hot, you know? So I made sure he got, I get around, and so many tears, and all that next shit. <laughs> yeah. It always felt like I was in the studio putting music behind Huey Newton or Malcolm X's. I knew it was important. It was honor when Pac called you just stopped what you were doing took all your equipment and flew to wherever he was and went in the studio and shock a hustler and I'm a hustler so everybody understand it ain't no one man gonna stay in one spot forever that's a sucker it ain't about milking off the next man that's a motherfucking hoe I'm a motherfucking pimp I'm finna come up on my own I'm gonna get my own sack so I took what little bit he gave me and doubled up and doubled up and doubled up and I've been doubling since and I'm gonna keep on doubling till these niggas kill me and that's that the real tension in Tupac was about remaining true to the people who produced him. And that was where he got this keeping it real. He wanted to be the real nigga. And the real nigga was always in conflict with the other sides of his personality. And all this risk that niggas trying to make me go through, I'm gonna make them feel the fire like I got to feel the fire. And that's real, and anybody can't understand that, they don't understand a black thing. It's gonna stay black. I'm not finna act white just cause y'all want me to act white. I'm gonna buy Benz cause that's what niggas do. Right. You understand me? I'm gonna smoke weed cause that's what niggas do. I'm gonna pack a gat cause that's what niggas do. You understand me? I'm gonna get drunk cause that's what niggas do. You understand me? I'm not gonna change just cause motherfuckers got money. I mean, I knew it was all part of one person. It was all Pac, but he had two sides, the yin and yang, just like everybody. 
because everybody got a good side, everybody got a bad side. Just Pox was amped up a little bit more, you know what I'm saying? I grew up Panther-wise, you know what I'm saying? And, and nowadays, a nigga like, fuck that, she gotta survive. You know, I'm screaming black like the next man, but when the first shot lick off, you know, it's all good. Tupac was constantly defining and refining his political and philosophical views, always being challenged by the white ruling class. It got to the point where Tupac felt American laws would not protect him. We always had to take the route that was nonviolent, peaceful, um, logical, and more saintlier than every other race. You know, we could never take the stance, which was our true stance, to be straight soldiers, straight warriors, until hip hop came. When hardcore hip hop came, it was all right for a nigga to say, fuck y'all, you know, we gonna do what the fuck we want, you know, bang, bang, you know, it was cool for a nigga to do that. Thug life became the ruling philosophy. How could he unify and service the people while protecting their culture and way of life, which was not being represented by any policymakers in Washington? That's what I like about Tupac. He said he was for the thugs. He didn't just mean people who beating women up and people who stealing. He meant a thug, T-H-U-G-L-I-F-E, the hate you gave little infants, F's everyone. He meant by nigga, N-I-G-G-A, never ignorant getting goals accomplished. Thug life is just the life of the streets and what quote unquote America think of uh, the minorities. America was built to murder. You know, you can ask the Indians that, so we, ain't, we don't even need to talk about what he created. You know, he ain't killed nobody, so he couldn't have did nothing. They ain't number words. Yes, I am gonna say that I'm a thug. That's because I came from the gutter, and I'm still here. I'm not saying I'm a thug because I want to rob you and rape people and things. I'm a businessman. I mean, I mean, you know I'm a businessman because you find me at my places of business. He felt that there was no greater pain in this country at this time than the pain of black America. It wasn't a manufactured image. When Pac became thug life, the embodiment of thug life, when he shot those cops, there was nothing manufactured. There was his diving into who he felt he was a voice for. This is a 10 millimeter, but I'm loading it with 40 um, millimeter bullets because it'll work, watch. And I feel as though everything I rap about, shit, anybody can check my card on it. And I got to be able to pull and pull, show and prove whenever somebody want to pull my card on it. He said he didn't have a record until he had a record deal. I mean, Tupac felt that he had to live the life he sang about in his song. That's great when it's applied to gospel music, terrible when it's applied to gangster rap. His whole thing with, with thug life and everything else, he knew that, that all of us, as far as the urban communities, everything was concerned, we was trapped and we was caged off. You know what I mean? So we couldn't be successful. So he was going to get the whole Thug Nation and turn it around and make it that movement. Feel any remorse for the cops that got killed? Wait, wait, I'm feeling my remorse. Wait, chill. <laughs> uh, can you fart? No. I mean, I would if I could, but I can't. Because it wasn't no remorse for Latasha. It wasn't no remorse for you, Seth Hawkins. And there wasn't no remorse when the motherfuckers kicked my ass. So they can all motherfucking die till they respect me as a motherfucking man. And every black man out there, they can all motherfucking die. And that's real. So they do, more motherfuckers gonna die. As long as they got bullets, it's gonna be some justice around this motherfucker. Motherfuckers are scared to be they self, God. You know, and he, and he was like, man, I'm myself good or bad. What? Deal with it, motherfucker. I'm putting it right in your face. America, this is what you made me. Now deal with me. I feel as though the ghetto is the ghetto, you know, and I don't think like it, it ain't no, it ain't near ghetto I can't go to and kick it and come up in. I don't care if colors or not. And I, I didn't always think that, so I'm not being cocky. I, I was scared of LA to whereas I didn't know nothing about the gang thing. That's the only thing I was scared of, just ignorance, not knowing where not to go. But shit, I done been out here long enough, they can smoke me. I really don't care, it's all good, you know what I'm saying? Watts, <laughs> this is Compton, 